As filmmakers, we're all familiar with how expensive it is to invest in gear, but the only thing worse than spending a ton of money on gear is spending money on gear that doesn't last. Over the years, I've made a lot of good buying decisions, but I've also made more questionable choices than I'd like to admit, and this video is all about sharing some tips on what to do and what to avoid if you don't want to throw your money away. Because even though we all need gear in order to tell the stories we're interested in, not all of it is created equal, and in this one, I'm going to get into six items that are a complete waste of your time and cash. This video isn't about me telling you that you need to have the very best gear out there, actually quite the opposite. Because at the end of the video, I'm going to go over the buying strategy that I've used throughout my career that actively avoids buying the most expensive cameras. But there are a few areas where investing in the wrong things is basically like lighting your money on fire, and I want to help you avoid that pain. So let's get into it. So let me start you off with a story about one of the dumbest ways I've ever tried to save money on gear. Years ago, when I bought my first cinema camera, a secondhand Sony FS5, I maxed out my budget on the body, a few lenses, and the best shotgun mic I could afford. Then, almost as an afterthought, I threw in a few extra accessories like HDMI and XLR cables to connect my mics and monitors to the camera. A month or so after getting it all in the mail, I got my first major job, which was a series of interviews for a huge international NGO. I packed my kit, feeling like a big time pro, and drove out to the first location on the outskirts of Mexico City, where I was living at the time, and got it all set up and looking nice. And speaking of locations, I should probably mention again why I'm sitting out here in the forest one more time in case you missed the last few videos. I'm actually shooting a TV show in the Canadian Arctic for the next couple of months, so I'll be away from my normal office setup until then. Anyways, uh, back to the story. The director then gave me the thumbs up and we started to roll, but about 10 minutes in, I started to hear a weird crackling sound through my headphones. Since everything was basically brand new, I figured it was just a monitoring issue or something with my headphones, so I just kept going. But after the shoot wrapped, I got an email from the client telling me that that crackling sound was there the whole interview and the main shotgun track was essentially useless. They were understandably pretty angry with me and it probably goes without saying, I never heard from them again. Eventually I figured out that the issue was actually with the super budget XLR cable I'd used to connect my boom mic to the camera, but by then it was way too late. I figured that since I'd bought a nice shotgun, I could save a bit on the cabling, but looking back, that's sort of like putting a $20 lens on an Alexa or cheap tires on an F1 car. It just doesn't make sense. Since then, I've always invested in professional quality cables, whether they're for audio or video transmission, and I'd highly suggest you do the same thing. At best, cheap cables are a waste of money that are just gonna end up in a landfill within a few months or maybe a year or something. At worst, they can ruin your shoot and make you look like an amateur. Something that isn't a waste of money, though, is the sponsor of this video, Audio but more on them later. The next piece of gear that is absolutely a waste of money in my opinion is another one that I got burned on personally. Last summer I shot and directed my first feature documentary and since I had an AC slash B-cam shooter with me the whole time, I decided that along with my main shooting camera, the FX9, I'd rig up my FX3 as a run and gun camera for him to operate or for those times when the FX9 was just too big and heavy to carry around. The only problem is that I only own one camera monitor, my small HD 502 that I've had for over five years now and I needed that for the AK cam. So I decided to try and save a bit of cash and go with a budget option from a company that I'm not going to name just because I don't want to throw shade on any specific manufacturer, but needless to say, it was a disaster. The number one thing I need from a monitor is reliable focus peaking, and I found out right away that this is something cheap monitors don't do well. They might do a really good job of marketing all the fancy functions like false color and LUT support and all that, but when it comes to actually using the thing in the field to frame and compose, for me, by far the most important thing is focusing, and the budget option failed big time. For me, it was such a problem that I actually ditched it completely and just went with the tiny built-in screen on the back of the camera. It's that much of a deal breaker for me. So yes, it's entirely possible that you might find a seven inch ultra bright monitor out there for like 10% the cost of the small HD, but in my opinion, it's not what you want and you'd be better off saving your money for something decent down the road. The next thing you might wanna save your money on, I'm gonna add here because it's the kind of thing you might be tempted to pair with a cheap monitor and those are off-brand batteries to power it. Batteries for camera gear can be insanely expensive and the Anton Bauer Titan batteries that I use are almost a thousand dollars for two plus a charger which is ridiculous I know but there's a reason that high-end batteries cost so much and that's because not all batteries are created equal far from it. Without going into the weeds here off-brand batteries get the price down by using low quality cells which means they don't hold charges as well their lifespan is super short and they tend to over 
overheat. Now, overheating is a huge issue, especially because it can add to the overall operating heat of your camera. And a lot of mirrorless cameras shooting 4K or 8K are already prone to overheating. So that can mean that your rig is gonna shut down in the middle of long runtime clips, like interviews, for example. There's not really much more to say here, but I'd personally rather have four high quality batteries than 10 off-brand batteries, because they're gonna last much longer. They're gonna hold the charge better and not end up in the dump six months from now. There's lots of places to save cash, but batteries are not the place. Speaking of saving cash, that's the perfect opportunity to talk about a longtime sponsor of the channel, and that's audio. As a filmmaker and because of this YouTube channel, I'm constantly in need of high quality royalty free music for all sorts of things. Over the years, I've tried pretty much every music service out there, but I always got annoyed with paying 200 bucks a year or more. But for viewers of this channel, Audio is offering a year of their pro plan, which includes thousands of royalty free music tracks and like tens of thousands of sound effects for about a quarter of the price. If you use the code Luke70, you're gonna get a full year's membership for just 59 bucks, which is an insane deal. You can even lock down a lifetime membership for 190 $99 by using the code Luke199, which is literally the same price as most of the other services charge per a year. I even scored a short film with nothing but audio music, so it's not just for YouTube either. So check out the link in the description and use the code either Luke70 or Luke199, depending on the option you go for, and save yourself a ton of money while supporting this channel at the same time. All right, back to the video. When it comes to cheap pieces of gear that are a total waste of your money, one of the worst offenders for me isn't just useless, it can actually ruin your footage. To give you a bit of context, when I switched over over from photo to video, there were a lot of things that I didn't really understand, like why variable ND filters were so essential to video shooting. So when everyone told me to get one for my DSLR kit, I was shocked by the price tag, and I thought there was no way I was gonna spend hundreds of dollars on a filter. In stills, I pretty much never needed filters, so I just bought the cheapest one I could find on Amazon and thought it would work. Big mistake. Big mistake. Big. Cheap filters do really horrible things to your image, like adding strange color tints or even like that big X pattern of contrast right through the picture to the point where it's actually unusable. The first time I took my cheap variable ND on a job, I learned this the hard way when I got back and tried to edit footage that had a massive green X through every clip. There's no post-production workaround that exists, at least not that I know of, and so just stay away from really discount filters. There's a lot of good brands out there. Uh, the one I'm currently using is this one, which is the Nisi True Color. Um, I like these ones because there's very little color shift at all that I've noticed. The main reason I like it is just this little metal rod that you can screw on so you can uh, adjust the filter by touch. So with gloves on and stuff, it's really easy. It's kind of a dumb reason to like a filter, but honestly, I don't see this out there very often and I absolutely love it. I use it all the time. So Nisi True Colors, they're great. There's lots of other options out there. Whatever brand you pick, just make sure they're well-made enough not to wreck your shots. And that doesn't necessarily mean just buying expensive ones. There's at least one extremely popular brand out there right now that's not cheap at all, but still throws all sorts of green tints on the picture that I would personally not use. So when it comes to quality filters, price is in everything. Again, I'm not here to blast any specific manufacturer company, so I'm not gonna name them. Just do your research and make sure you aren't gonna ruin your footage before you buy something. All right, the next thing I'm gonna suggest you not waste your money on is something else I didn't really have to deal with as a photographer but that became so important as a doc filmmaker and it's a specific piece of grip equipment. Since I was working as a photojournalist before I became a cinematographer, I really never used flashes or any kind of lighting, so there wasn't much need to go for grip gear, but these days I'm constantly using lights and boom poles and diffusion panels and flags and all sorts of other stuff that need to be held in position. On big sets, we'd normally just use C-stands for all that kind of stuff, but because dock shooters need to be mobile and need gear that can be checked on planes, C-stands are usually way too big and heavy to be practical on most jobs. So we're forced to use light stands and a lot of the time there's nothing sketchier than a thousand dollar light fixture sitting on top of a stand that looks like it might buckle at any time. Now it's a fine balance here because at the same time you don't want to have to carry around those massive light stands that are so long you're never going to be able to pack them into a normal duffel bag but you also don't really want to be going with something that's going to tip over in a light breeze. Not only do you risk smashing whatever you mount on it but you could potentially risk legal liability if you hurt someone when it falls. For me a good light stand should be able to hold at least your key light with diffusion or a boom pole with a shotgun mic on it safely to be useful. So skip those super cheap stands that come in sets of two for like 35 bucks on Amazon because they'll either break, fall,
fall or just be so flimsy that you'll never feel comfortable bringing them on set and then they'll end up in the dump in six months. All right, the next thing I wanna touch on isn't about an external tool used to achieve a specific effect. It's all about what you do with that footage once it's captured. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you at some stage in your career. Maybe you've just gotten into shooting video and bought a camera. You start practicing and maybe working on your first short project when you notice that your laptop is starting to fill up. So you start looking around on Amazon and find a one terabyte SSD drive for $39.99 or something crazy like that. The last piece of advice I'm gonna give for today is to please, please, please not buy it. In the digital age, hard drives are often the only place your footage, i.e. your life's work as a filmmaker exists. And even though storage is getting cheaper and cheaper, when it comes to your archives, you do not wanna go cheap. Hard drives fail. In fact, last month, there were a ton of articles out there that exposed the ridiculous failure numbers on the SanDisk Extreme Pro SSDs, which were and probably still are one of the more popular drives out there. And if a drive from a major manufacturer fails enough to be pulled from Petapixel's recommended list, then you can only imagine the risk you're taking with a no-name brand. I get it, hard drives are expensive, but the only thing worse than spending money on them is plugging yours in one day only to realize that a year's worth of work has just vanished. You hear those geese? That's not a good sign. That means that winter's coming fast. There've been geese flying overhead all day and they're leaving us. Soon we're gonna be buried in snow. Winter is coming. Okay, back to the video. You should always have two copies of your work anyways, but sinking your money into knockoff hard drives is just almost always a bad idea. It's like buying a nice car and then putting a battery in it from Dollarama. It's gonna make everything unreliable and it's not gonna last. Because at the end of the day, this just isn't about trying to build up a high quality kit so you can have confidence in it as a professional, though that is a massive benefit of not wasting your money on stuff. It's also to stop the cycle of consumption and pollution that comes from buying cheap electronics and then just throwing them away to buy more cheap stuff. Buy nice or buy twice is true in most areas of filmmaking gear, but when it comes to the six things I mentioned in this video, it's especially true. Instead, I suggest saving money on gear by buying used high quality stuff. I personally have only ever bought one new camera in my entire career. My first stills camera was used, my first cinema camera, uh, an FS5 was used, and so was my FS7, and so is the FX9 I use now. The only camera I ever bought new was the FX3 that I'm using for this YouTube channel, and that's only because when I needed it, it was so new that there were no used ones available. Buying used lenses is also a great way to save cash and all but one of the Sigma Primes I use were bought from Facebook Marketplace. Sure, you do need to do your due diligence and make sure that everything works, but in the decade plus I've been doing this, I've never really seen a camera hit its runtime limit and stop working. I just did a quick check on eBay and you can get an FS7 body right now for 1200 bucks. And even though that's a pretty old camera at this point, I used it to shoot multiple Netflix shows. So it's still more than good enough for professional work today. There's a lot more life left in most quality gear than we realize and for me that's the way to save cash while still getting things that will work for years. But skimping on the stuff I talked about today will almost always be a bad idea and I think you'll be a lot happier if you just don't do it. See ya!